Family vlogger Micah Stouffer placed her adopted son with special needs with a new family, and people are outraged. Welcome to the first part of this series on Micah Stouffer. Since this is a series, please wait until you watch all parts before forming your opinion on the Stouffers and their actions. Before I get into the story, I just want to put out a disclaimer. Please do not send any hate to Micah Stouffer, James Stouffer, or anyone else mentioned in this story. This video is simply meant to report on the news and give some insight on the situation. In order to understand the current situation, we need to go back in time. Micah Stouffer is the former registered nurse who has been posting lifestyle and parenting content on YouTube since 2014. She has also supplemented her personal YouTube channel with a family vlogging channel, The Stouffer Life. Her husband, James, also has a YouTube channel, Stouffer Garage, that has almost a million subscribers and several videos with millions of views each. In July 2016, Micah and James posted a video announcing they'd be adopting their fourth child, a boy from China. They also said they were planning on adopting another child from Uganda or Ethiopia in the future. Over the next year, Micah made 27 videos about her adoption journey. The videos have since been made private. Many of the videos posted around this time were monetized or sponsored. As well, her adoption videos kick-started the rise of her channel. Her views went up significantly after she started sharing her adoption journey. She acknowledged this in one of her videos. I have so many viewers that found me through my adoption journey and they are here to kind of live through those adoption updates and kind of see how he's doing and watch him progress. If you are one of those people that are here for that, give this video a thumbs up. I know some of my audience is all about the cleaning and organization space and some people are like, I am here for that. And if you are, I don't blame you. Micah also started a fundraiser to cover the adoption fees. In a video posted in January 2017 called China Adoption Journey Part 3, Micah spoke about the fundraiser. The thing I want to fill you in on is we are doing a little fundraiser for little We are going to be revealing how to picture it to you guys and to the world. And we're so excited to share our little boy with you guys. Just so tremendously excited. We'll have a link to the fundraiser um, if you guys want to donate um, in the description box below, but we have a thousand piece puzzle and every time someone donates, each puzzle piece is worth $5. Every time someone donates, we start putting the puzzle pieces together. In an article she wrote for Parade in 2019, Micah explained how she and her husband selected the child they were planning to adopt. Since Chinese adoption laws only allow U.S. couples to adopt children who have special needs, besides other stipulations, at first, we couldn't wrap our heads around special needs adoption. We would just say, no, we can't handle all of that. We just want a simple adoption. But as we let the idea soak in, God softened our hearts. Before we knew it, we were open to almost every special needs in the book. Next, we picked what we thought would be the perfect agency that I had researched for weeks. We were set and ready for the next step, until I saw a little face I couldn't walk away from. The agency that was assigned his file refused to release it to our current agency, so we urgently switched agencies just to have permission to review his file, paying a $500 non-refundable fee just to do it. His special need was listed as brain damage, and once we finally reviewed his file, it stated that he had a brain tumor. As an oncology nurse, tumors didn't scare me. In the China adoption video, Micah said doctors tried to discourage her from adopting a child with special needs. Like saying that this is going to be severe, this is going to be a lot, you know, we don't know what unknown elements could be. Um, and for us, it was hard. It was hard to hear somebody say that, but for me, more than anything, I go from one diagnosis to a totally different diagnosis. But Immediately when she gave me another diagnosis, I looked at the bright side. I was like, you know, that could be awesome. There could be so many good things about that second diagnosis. And we asked for a little, couple more videos from um, the foster mama that is taking care of our little boy right now. And she provided them. And if anything, my child is not returnable. I, so when I heard all of the things that that doctor was telling us, it kind of went in one ear and out the other. I wasn't in a state of denial. I accepted and took on everything that she said. And I sat down with Jim, I said, you know, worst case situation, if our little boy at one point in his life, he needed to be in a wheelchair and he needed full on care, would you still love him? And we, without a doubt in our minds, we knew, no matter what state he came to us, that we would love him. And 
that's one thing that I'm starting to love about this process is the level of humble, becoming more humble, and the level of unconditional love that we're starting to develop for this little boy is just unbelievable. And I love that because for us, this new diagnosis didn't scare us. If anything, it kind of solidified that this is more our son than he has ever been and we don't care what's wrong with him. She also spoke about being comfortable with different kinds of special needs. What we wanted to do because we most likely knew we wanted a kiddo that was a special focus kiddo, meaning that they had a medical condition or maybe they had a disease or maybe they had a diagnosis that is unfavorable. Any of those things could be a possibility. So what me and my husband did is we started talking to physicians, we started ta having meetings, we started doing tons of different things so that we could really figure out which conditions, which systems in the body we were comfortable with. So like I said, we sat down with tons of different physicians, we called different doctors, we chatted about different things we knew, just so that we could be really well educated on different conditions. So we came to a consensus that these are all of the conditions that we would be open to. As an RN, I kind of knew that I would be fairly comfortable with quite a few things because I have seen so many different conditions in my scope of practice. So my comfort level is very, very, very high. Um, as, so for example, on the medical checklist for all of the conditions that kiddos could have, Let's just say there's a hundred conditions. Me and my husband were comfortable with 99 of the conditions. So we were very, very open. In a video titled, Would I Ever Adopt Again? My true opinion about China adoption. Micah said she adopted from China because she did not want to adopt within the United States and it was one of the few countries that would allow her to adopt. She had no fertility issues and she already had three children. That, that was something that I wanted to do. And when I talked to my husband, the first thing we talked about is foster to adopt. And and for him, he felt that his heart wasn't quite ready for that because he didn't want a child to be taken away from him. So we kind of ruled that one out for that time period. And then we talked to a lot of social workers in our country, in the United States, and they were telling us if we adopted through the state, the youngest child we would get is six unless they had a severe medical need like a trach or um, a more complicated medical need that needed more um, interventions or it was a sibling group. At least that's what we were told from a couple different social workers. We looked into like different requirements, we talked to tons of people, and I said, you know, this is how long we've been married, this is how many kids we have in our home, because we already had a larger family, three kids in our home. So there were some countries that we were already excluded from. In October 2017, Micah posted a vlog titled emotional adoption video, Gotcha Day China Adoption. The video has since been made private, but it had over five and a half million views before it was taken down. It was also the most popular video on her channel. After she adopted her son, Micah featured him prominently in her Instagram posts and YouTube videos. However, she often hinted at trouble in paradise. In a video titled, My China Adoption Experience, The Truth, she described the first few days after the adoption. I feel like I wasn't prepared enough for what trauma truly looked like. And that's okay, that happens, you know? Like sometimes you'll prepare for a natural birth and you'll get into the contractions and you've read like tons of literature and then you get to like the hard stuff and it's your first baby and you're like, oh my gosh, this is really hard. I didn't prepare for it. And that's the same thing that happened to Jim and I. We just didn't truly prepare for what trauma looks like. And it is hard, it is messy, and it is so sad. I remember praying like, am I strong enough to be his mama? Can I do this? Can I give him what he needs? And it, one of the hardest things about um, our first week in China was we grieved so hard. And since on that gotcha day, Jimmy had to hold him because he was so strong and I couldn't, I couldn't physically hold him any longer. He started to look at Jimmy as his comfort person because he was strong, he was always holding him, and he started taking care of him. You know, from those first couple hours that we had him as our son in the hotel room, he, and he initially took to Jimmy because Jimmy's obviously doing those things for him. And because of that, he completely rejected me on the most hardest level humanly possible. 
In an article Micah wrote for The Bump in 2019, she explained more about the special needs the child had and how he interacted with the rest of the family. In December of 2016, my husband and I decided to accept a file through our adoption agency, WACAP, for a beautiful one-year-old little boy who was diagnosed with a brain cyst. We had been told that, at two and a half years old, he spoke Chinese, could write Chinese characters for fun, and was meeting all of his developmental milestones. WACAP noted he had a small brain tumor, but that it didn't affect his cognitive abilities. But we saw behaviors firsthand that we couldn't explain. In fact, he didn't understand Chinese, and was profoundly developmentally delayed. He would violently bang his head against the wall and bite and pinch anyone who came too close, including his new siblings. Many people tried to tell me it was just trauma or fear from having his entire life flipped upside down, and it would all fade away in a few weeks. That proved not to be the case. We waited and waited and never saw any change. After taking him to see several specialists, we discovered he had had a small stroke in utero. The neurologist felt he was going to be a perfectly normal child and would catch up to his peers in no time. But months passed and we saw no change in his behavior, so we began to seek out resources for therapies that were recommended to us by our adoption center physicians. And every therapist that treated our son hinted at sensory processing disorder, autism, ADHD, and global developmental delays. When the results came back, we we finally had our answer. He had Autism Spectrum Disorder Level 3. The emotional hardships we endured that first year prompted me to do some soul-searching and ask myself some really hard questions. Why am I so heartbroken over my new reality? I have a happy little boy who is no longer living in horrible conditions, and that's not good enough for me. What's wrong with me? I quickly learned that he wasn't the one who needed to change, it was me. One of the most incredible lessons my autistic son has taught me is to see the beauty in life, and he taught me to quit giving a damn about what other people think. To be frank, they don't have to understand. All that matters is that we're doing what's best for our family. We still have some hard days. I still seek guidance and ask for help. And sometimes, I still break down in tears. But the one thing I know for sure is that he doesn't go a day without being endlessly loved. Adoption is love. It takes lots of grit, sweat, and tears, but it's so worth it in the end. Even if your ending looks different than you had planned, just remember, different isn't a bad thing. Micah also highlighted her son's meltdowns in several different vlogs over the years. Look at my eyes. We don't bite. Biting is not nice. Look at my eyes. No bite. I know you want squeezes on your arm, but look at me. You don't bite the teacher, that's not nice. Do you want squeeze? Squeeze, 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 squeeze. So squeeze. Like look at my eyes. You still do not bite the teacher. That's not nice. Come on, let's go get a snack. Come on, no bite. Biting is not nice. This is like eighth tantrum. No more. Come on, let's go. You're not gonna throw a fit when you don't get your way. That's not okay. Let's go. Are you done fitting? Are you done? Are you all done? Has had multiple meltdowns. You're not having a good day today. We never tell you guys the truth. And that's why you don't see him out in the box. He's probably having a meltdown. Are you done? He's just having a bad yourself? day. He's a grumpy day today. In this clip, Micah discussed getting cheaper therapy for her son while allegedly wearing a $6,000 Cartier bracelet. I'm excited to see what happens. We're going to go to a different speech therapist. Not the one that's by about $100 a month. Oh, yeah, yeah. But we're going to go to the one that um, has like $70 for 30 minutes. And he starts preschool too, so he'll get therapy there. So it'll all work out. There were also several instances where she and James appeared to treat their adopted son differently compared to their biological children. In this clip, James spoke about why their adopted son went to bed before the rest of the kids. He is laying down, and guys, he goes in his room to lay down at 7.30 because I know people have been asking. He goes down usually early at the end of the day because he has special needs, and in our house, he requires an extra amount of attention and just help with everything from Mike and I. So. A lot of the times our attention is taken by him a lot more during the day. And at nighttime when he goes down at 7.30 because he's ready for bed, he's like, 
he's three and a half, but he's kind of like a one-year-old developmentally. So for him, night time is like 7.30, a little bit earlier. And then we let the other kids stay up a couple extra hours just to hang out in our bedroom, watch a movie, and just kind of get that mom and dad time that, you know, kind of takes during the day. And it's not that we don't love or that it's not as special, but like, you know, all day long, needs just a little bit more attention. So it's our way of kind of giving the kids that as well at nighttime. So that's why sometimes you see go to bed before the other kids. As well, viewers noticed a difference between how Micah handled her adopted son's thumb sucking and her biological child's thumb sucking. In an update video, the adopted son was shown wearing a thumb guard and Micah said she was trying to get him to stop sucking his thumb. If you guys notice, he has a little thumb guard on his hand. Per our dentist request, he recommended that we probably should get that or he might need some surgeries in the future, which I definitely am not pro-surgery, so if I can prevent it, I will try my best. That was a big comfort item of his. He sucks his thumb quite a bit, so we've been trying to do lots of back rubs and different things like that to help and give him a new comfort item. The adopted son was also shown with duct tape on his thumb in a different video. But when her older daughter was sucking on her thumb in 2015, Micah said she hoped her daughter never stopped. I hope she never stops sucking her thumb. She doesn't do it in public, so I'm not worried about it. I love it and will be sad when she stops. That was the first thing in her baby life I feel in love with. I don't want to stop her. I want her to do it at her own time, especially in her situation with living in split home. I think it helps. However, Micah always emphasized throughout the years that she didn't regret the adoption and she would never give up on her son. Roughly a year after adopting her son, Micah announced she was expecting her fifth child. She gave birth in June 2019. After giving birth to her fifth child, some fans suspected that Micah lost interest in her adopted son. Early in 2020, Micah stopped posting vlogs on the Sofa Life channel, and fans noticed that her adopted son had not been seen in any new photos since February. When one fan asked about the boy, they said Micah blocked them immediately. Some fans became worried for the child's safety and started several anonymous accounts dedicated to documenting what was happening and finding out what happened to him. On February 16th, Micah posted the last new photo that featured him on her Instagram. The last couple days have been hard. I don't want to sugarcoat anything. We have had a lot of meltdowns and lots of behaviors that have had us on our knees begging God for guidance. On social media and YouTube, we rarely show the behaviors or the hard stuff because we try our best to respect our son's privacy and dignity. We have hard days, lots of them. I wish autism and adoption drama had a manual to direct you through it all. On March 23rd, Micah posted an older photo of her adopted son. Last month was the hardest month I have ever had as a mama, and I'm still working through all of it. But instead of leading with my heart, I'm following yours. Adoption Trauma, Adoptee, Adoptee Voice, Reactive Attachment Disorder. On May 14th, a fan commented on one of Micah's YouTube videos asking about their vlogs. Have you ever said why you guys stopped vlogging? I miss y'all. Micah replied, We have stopped temporarily due to some things going on with we hope to be able to post a video as to why in the next couple weeks. One anonymous account, Micah Stouffer fan, posted a screenshot of a DM from someone who claimed to live near her. It is true. I live in near her and have mutual friends. She has told people about how he doesn't want to cooperate with her filming and stuff, and because of that, he doesn't fit in with them. She hasn't put nearly as much effort as she could to meet his needs. The truth will come out soon. On May 17th, Micah addressed trolls on her Instagram story. Horrible things, and I think every influencer gets that to a degree. They have their own thing that they're going through, and we're going through our own season, and we have a handful of just trolls, and they think that I'm such a bad mom or whatever they want to think, but it's funny because they still follow. They still don't miss a single post. They still don't miss an opportunity to run to the drama forums. It's like, if you don't want to be here, unfollow me. If I'm such a bad person and I've done you wrong in so many ways, unfollow. I 100% agree with that. On Mother's Day, Micah posted an old photo of herself pregnant with her fifth child. Thinking of all mamas today, hoping you had a beautiful day full of happiness, hugs, and cuddles. Today was my hardest Mother's Day I have ever had. 
Just know that I'm so grateful for your heart and the way you mother. Motherhood is not always easy, sometimes it's hard, messy, and unpredictable. But I'm in awe at how many moms just lead with the most selfless heart and kindest soul. Just know you are doing an amazing job. On May 22nd, one of Micah's friends defended her. Well, first, don't tell me what to do. Second, unless you have any idea what their life was like every single day, don't judge. Were you there? Were you a fly on the wall watching the terror for the last couple of years? Have you ever spent even one minute with You know nothing, absolutely nothing. Shame on you. If you don't agree with her choices, then unfollow her. If you think for one second that your opinion means anything, you are sorely mistaken. Move along. Micah Stouffer fan posted a screenshot of a comment from someone whose family friends know Micah. I wasn't going to say anything, but I feel like I should. Some family friends of mine are YouTubers. They have met Micah at conventions and such. They said she seemed really sweet and had a relaxing voice. Then, when she thought they were out of earshot, she snapped at James with this harsh voice. After she came home from China with the family told me that they suspected she adopted him for views. Micah had explained that views weren't going well until she started making adoption videos. I didn't want to believe them, but I have such a sick feeling about the situation. On May 23rd, Micah posted a photo to her Instagram feed addressing the people calling her out. This week has been such a learning experience. People can throw some really ugly words around and say completely hurtful and untrue statements, but instead of reacting and being hurtful right back, I want to step back and learn from that person in that moment. God forgives like no one's business, and just because naturally I want to defend or stand up for my character, it's not necessary. True character is known and does not need to be shown. And three days later, Micah finally told her viewers about what was going on with her family. This is the end of part one. Again, please wait until the end of the series before forming your opinion on what happened. In the next part, Micah reveals what happened to her son, and more people come forward with shocking details. All that and more, coming up in part two.